Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Dorian Peters, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, criminal law, criminal trials, criminal practice. Um, let me tell you uh, a little bit about myself, and then I'll tell you uh, where we're going uh, with this presentation. Um, I uh, was born and raised in Berkeley, and uh, went to undergrad at UC Berkeley, and I went to law school in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Vanderbilt University. Um, worked a bunch of places through law school, but I'll just sum it up. Uh, I worked at a public defender's office. I worked for a federal judge. I worked at a U.S. attorney's office. Then I worked at the DA's office in Contra Costa County. Um, I was there as a law clerk, uh, as a 2L law clerk, as a, I guess, a 3L or a post bar law clerk. Uh, and then I worked there as a district attorney for about four years. Um, I worked briefly at another district attorney's office, briefly for the Department of Corrections, and then I went into private practice. I've been doing private criminal defense now for uh, about a year, um, both on the prosecution side and the defense side. I handle, I've handled, I guess, hundreds of misdemeanor cases, um, probably almost uh, hundreds of felony cases, too. Um, I've tried uh, you know, DUIs, thefts, uh, robberies, uh, guns drugs, uh, attempted murder, um, you know, I've, I've tried most of the stuff out there um, that at least in this DA's office is not within a vertical unit. Um, this class is uh, really geared toward people who are new to our criminal law. So we're not going to be talking about uh, many of the parts of criminal law that are unique to uh, sort of the serious felony cases. Um, you know, if people have questions about felonies, um, I'll be happy to answer them, um, but I'm going to mostly stick steer away from sort of the uh, procedural and legal things that are sort of unique to felony cases. I'm going to start stick with those uh, things that uh, we're going to deal with in misdemeanors. Um, so with that, uh, let's get started. Um, so I guess before we get into sort of the details, um, I guess what's the big picture? So the beginning of every uh, criminal law case is a complaint. It's a criminal complaint. And if you uh, got a, the information packet uh, right at the uh, entry, you'll see that the document that says uh, on the upper right hand corner says filed December 11th, 2013, that document is a criminal complaint. Um, all, of the doc all of the criminal complaints filed in Contra Costa County look similar to this document. Same typeface, same really ugly carrier font. Um, looks like it was done on an obsolete uh, word processor because it was. Um, this complaint is somewhat unique in a couple of ways, um, and I'm going to go over some of the things that make it unique. But I picked this complaint in particular uh, because it has some of the issues that we're going to face uh, if you do misdemeanor case in this county, uh, particularly if you do them through uh, our county conflicts uh, panel. Speaking of which, who here knows what the Contra Costa County conflicts panel is? All right. How many people are on it or have thought about getting on it to do misdemeanor criminal cases? All right. And are all the people that just raised their hand on it or you just thought about it? Thought about it? Mostly thought about it? Okay. So. Some, some people on it, on it, yeah. Okay. Found request. Yeah, that's true. But I, I got a good idea of, of, it looks like about just under half the folks who raised their hand the first time are on, and of, of most of the people here are thinking about it. So um, on the criminal conflicts panel, um, if you join that, you'll have an opportunity to represent people accused of misdemeanor cases. Usually, those people will be people who are charged as co-defendants. Um, and this criminal complaint, you'll notice, lists three names on it. And the reason it lists three names is because three people are being charged with crimes all within a single complaint. And the public defender can represent one of those uh, persons. Uh, the alternate defender's office can represent another. Uh, but after that, uh, they have what's called a conflict, and they can't represent the third person ethically. And so the third person will get referred to what's called the conflicts panel, and then it will be appointed to the people on the panel, uh, such as myself, and such as you, if uh, you apply to be on the panel, which uh, I hope that you do, because it's a great way to get your first criminal case, and it's a great way to learn and get some good experience. Um, 
because many of the cases coming from the conflicts panel, um, due to their nature, are their conflicts, they will often be co-defendant cases. So it'll usually be your client who is accused along with one or two other people of either the same crime uh, or a similar crime. So that's why we have a complaint here with three co-defendants. Now, the complaint starts a case, and a case typically ends, and I, I just put the word ends in quotes, either uh, with a trial or with a plea of guilty. Or sometimes before that, the DA will just voluntarily dismiss. That doesn't happen that often in this, in this county. Um, sometimes a, a, a pretrial motion can also uh, end the case. So that's what we're talking about, what happens sort of between the filing of a complaint and the time a case ends. So when you join the conflicts panel and you get a call, someone from the conflicts panel like Kat is going to say, hey, we have a misdemeanor case and it's a misdemeanor and your client is named John Doe. And we want you to show up at Martinez tomorrow at 8.30 uh, and appear at arraignment. And arraignment is essentially your first court date where you appear, you usually meet your client, and then you get a copy of the complaint, and you usually get a copy of the discovery. When we say the discovery uh, in criminal cases, usually we simply mean the police reports. Uh, sometimes the police reports will have pictures or audio tapes or videotapes, depending on the type of case, but that's usually Usually in the court file, you usually just have the police reports. Um, you'll usually have to call the DA or send a request to the DA to get more information. When you get the complaint, there's a few things you want to look at when you get it. Um, one, you want to figure out who's charged with what. And sometimes it's not easy to tell at a glance. Like, for instance, looking down at the complaint in front of you, can you tell me who's charged with what right offhand? Does anyone know? Why don't we look through this complaint for just a second and see if we can figure out who's charged with what. So there's Lincoln, there's Jones, and there's Dow. So let's, let's start off with Lincoln since he's listed first. Has anyone figured out what Lincoln's charged with in this case? All right, Marta. Our president. Kathy Theft. All right. And how, where is that on the complaint? Count three. That's right. That's Lincoln. Is he charged anywhere else on the complaint? No. All right. So we know that Timothy Lincoln charged with petty theft. Let's try uh, Dad. What is she charged with? That's a hard one. A little bit harder. But does yeah. any, can anyone figure that out, though? One, one and four. Yeah, Dow is charged in count one and in count four. And what are the crimes she's accused of? You know, <laughs> up here in the front? Petty theft with a prior and commercial, second degree commercial burglary. All right. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. Is Dow charged with anything else? Probation violation. Probation violation, that's right. That's right. Okay. So we pretty much have this complaint figured out. Um, there's also Jones. I didn't ask about her. Uh, but she's also charged with petty theft, basically the same as, as Mr. Lincoln. So we have to parse through this. It took, it took a couple seconds, but uh, the first time you get a complaint, you want to just take a look at it and parse through it and figure out what your client is charged with. Maybe try to figure out what the other people are charged with, too, so that way you kind of have an idea of where uh, your client fits into a, a bigger picture. But it's really important to understand that when we think of petty theft, certainly we have an idea of what that crime may mean. Or when we hear of a burglary or a robbery, we have an idea of what that uh, may mean. But how do we figure out what that means in the books? How do we know whether our client committed that crime? And does anyone know where we kind of start when trying to figure out, you know, in terms of the meat, what is a petty theft under the law of California? Where do we find that? Yeah, well, 
Number one, there's a, there's a few places to look. A good, a good starting point is the language on the complaint. Usually, the language on the complaint will track the language of the statute to some extent. It doesn't always do it. Most times it does. Um, you typically want to check. Um, but for the most common offenses, yeah, it, it will typically track the language of the statute. But you may want to <coughs> take a look at the penal code section just to make sure because the complaint does not always track the language of the statute. So if you turn a few pages in the packet that I handed you, you'll see that, um, I guess, one, two, three, four pages in, on the left side, I threw in a statute. It's penal code section 44. Because we know that three of the four charges in this case are some type of theft. And each of them starts off with 484 if you look at the numbers that are, that are selected on the complaint. So, as you can see, theft is, there's quite a bit of language there. It actually spans two pages. Um, and so, do you think that the DA who charged your client with petty theft read through this entire page in deciding whether your client committed a petty theft? No. No. All right. Um, if you turn the page one more time, well, actually, a couple more times. I want you to turn until you see something called theft, 1800, theft by larceny. Does anyone recognize that piece of paper and what that is, where that comes from? Marta? I think it's a jury instruction. It is a jury instruction. <laughs> and the jury instructions are actually going to be really important when you are first getting your, when you can first understand what charges your client is facing, and when you want to figure out what the heck this charge means, sort of in plain language under California law, you're going to want to look at the jury instructions. And most DAs that I know who are charging uh, crimes use the jury instructions. Most DAs that go in to do preliminary hearings and felony cases use the jury instructions, and I know that even. The judges use the jury instructions to a very large extent, and um, if you can, if you take a look at, you know, that jury instruction and you compare it to the language that was in the statute, um, I think you can definitely see that the jury instruction does a much better job uh, for both of attorneys and lawyers of sort of spelling out what this uh, crime is. So far, does anyone have any questions about what we've covered? All right. Now, when going over the jury instructions, um, you'll notice that each part of the jury instruction is numbered. And in law school, you know, we frequently in our criminal law classes uh, talked about sort of the elements of a tort or elements of a crime. And you know, we have the elements of a crime here in the jury instructions. And below the jury instruction, you have what's called the bench notes. And the bench notes can be a little long. Um, and they cite to sort of case law. And here's what I recommend that you do. Uh, when you get a case, take a look at the jury instruction and read the language. And if you have questions about what some of that language means, then go to the bench notes, because the bench notes tend to sometimes clarify some of the things that are not made clear uh, by the language itself. But the language itself is what the jury, if your case ever goes to trial, that's what the jury's gonna see. And so when they're deciding whether your client committed a crime or they didn't, that's the language they're going to be, you know, comparing your client's conduct to. So the jury instructions are good. They're really good. Um, technically speaking, though, the jury instructions are not law. Uh, they are sort of, they're made by the Judicial Council, um, which is an organization created by the courts that sort of assist the courts but, um, and almost have the power of law, but don't quite have the power of law. Um, one of the dirty secrets about the jury instructions is that they're um, not always accurate. Um, in fact, they get changed um, almost every year because you know, new case law comes out that interprets the word a different way, and then they have to switch all the bench notes and so on. Uh, but for our purposes, they're 100% correct. And when you become an expert at criminal law, and start doing appellate work, um, you can argue, you can start arguing that the jury instructions are wrong. But in my six years, I haven't had an occasion to do that. 
And usually when that does happen, it's usually like a statewide effort by like a public defender's association or a DA's association to get a case changed. And then they got to find a perfect case. And um, it, it goes well beyond what, what we need to do. So, um, so the jury instructions are really uh, a great place uh, to start. Um, make sure you read them very, very carefully because it's very easy to miss what seems like almost meaningless words in those instructions. So you, you start to catch some of the traps uh, once you've had a case and sort of forgot one of those uh, key elements. But I've shown you the petty theft instruction. If you flip through it some more, um, you're going to see a few more. There's one that talks about grand theft. And then a few more pages in, there's one that talks about burglary. In law school, you learn, of bur you learn about burglary, and you learn that it's basically an unlawful entry into a building or a structure. And that's, for the most part, true. Um, you know, it, it, in California, the law is, is very similar. Um, but sometimes there's a little bit of nuance uh, in, in it. And, um, you know, it does, does, does entering a room count? If you, if you enter, you know, if you went to a room with, you know, felonious intent, does that count as, uh, as a burglary? Of course, you said yes. Um, if you <coughs> stick your hand in a window attempting to rob the house and then decide, oh, you know, this house doesn't seem like such a great place, house to, bur you know, to burglarize, and then you leave, did you commit a burglary since your body didn't go in? Those are the things you're going to find in the bench notes. So, um... So they're really important, particularly where your case is sort of a, a, an edge case scenario. Let's talk a little bit about um, things to look for. I'm going to actually, I've been talking a little bit about elements. I've been talking a little bit about the Calcrims. And we can come back to that. But I actually want to go back to the complaint again. Because the complaint is, at, at least initially, the only thing you're going to see. And when you go into court for the first time and you get the complaints, sometimes you're going to have a chance to review the discovery. Sometimes you're not. Frankly, I kind of put the cart before the horse a little bit because you're not even going to get to the elements until you have a chance to review the police reports, see the facts, and sort of get a chance to analyze your case. So I want to go back to when you get the complaint in court and you look at it. What are, what are the things that you're looking for on the complaint? Itself, I said you want to look at the charges, and that makes sense, right? You want to look at the charges. But there's actually a couple of things that you want to take a look at before you even enter a plea for your client. Um, one is statute of limitations. Does anyone know what statute of limitations uh, is in a, in a criminal case? Depends on whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. Yep, that is right. Does anyone know what the statute of limitation is for misdemeanors? Are there any exceptions to that? There, there are exceptions. Um, there's some fraud exceptions, uh, a couple business and profession codes that, that have some exceptions. But by and large, the answer is one year. So when you get a complaint, check for real basic stuff like statute of limitations. Make sure your client is not being charged and was not charged with something that happened over a year ago, where it was filed over a year ago. Sometimes your client will come to court uh, well over that year. That's a different issue, which we'll cover in a future future uh, lesson. But check for, for statute of limitations. That's, that's a really important issue. What is it called? From the occurrence or from the filing? Yeah, so the one year is um, the, the, the time you're calculating is the date of the crime to the date the complaint is filed. So, um, there are, like I said, there are some exceptions. Um, if your guy learned about the charges, fled the state, and then came back to the state, you know, if it was uh, certain types of fraud, uh, sometimes the start, start of the sexual limitations will be when the fraud was discovered. So there are some of the exceptions that you might have learned about in law school. Um, but by and large, it's the date of the incident to the filing of the complaint. Another thing to look for, um, and 
this is going to be uh, particularly important in co-defendant cases, is you want to look for what's called proper joinder. Does anyone know what I mean when I say joinder in, a, in the criminal context? Oh, this side, how about this side of the room? Over here. I was going to say, they have to, well, uh, there's compulsory, like compulsory service, so they have to be in there in order to effectively resolve the case. Yeah. Because you can have inconsistent results. That's, that's true. The, 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 the thing about uh, joinder, what I'm referring to is the fact that in one complaint, sometimes, like in this one, you have multiple defendants. And on top of multiple defendants in this complaint, sometimes you have multiple crimes. And the fact of the matter is, when you are filing charges, you can't take everything someone's done their whole life and put it all on one criminal complaint. There has to be something that links those crimes together in some logical way. So, um, in the typical co-defendant case, if three people go out and commit a crime together, they could be charged on a single complaint because it happened in sort of one, a, one uh, single set of events that happened together. Um, or, so that's, that, that's the most common proper joinder scenario. Um, sometimes you'll see one person charged, but they'll be charged with crimes that happened on different days. Can you do that? Like, can we give an example? Let's say you have someone who is charged with a DUI that happened on January 1st. Then you have a guy, the same guy, commits a DUI on February 1st. DA gets these two DUIs and they file charges on April. And they go, count one, DUI, January. Count two, DUI, February. Can you do that? What do we think? Let's, let's have a vote. How many people say, yeah? How many people say, heck no? The answer is yes. The DA can do that. And another way to properly join, join a case or join charges is by charging the same offense or class of offenses. All right? So if someone commits a string of bank robberies or a string of DUIs or a string of thefts, those can all be charged on a single complaint. All right. What if person A and person B commit a bank robbery in January, and person B and person C commit a bank robbery in February? Can we charge those guys together in April? What do we think now? Yes or no? Yes. And yes, no, I saw one thumbs down, Marta? Well, there is enough commonality with B being in both crimes and they were both the same crimes. All right. And what about A and C? What if, okay, so let's say we, we all agree, B by himself could be charged with both on a single complaint, right? We, we, we covered that. But what about A and C? What if they go, hey, you guys are taking us for this ride. I mean, yeah, I did this one, but the jury's going to hear about two. And I knew about the first one. I didn't know about the second one. And I'm going to get convicted because they're going to have about these two robberies. And I only did one. What the hell? That's true. What, 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 what is the judge going to say? Separate. The answer is they are properly joined. But you can ask a judge to sever them. The judge does not have to say yes, but there's sort of a balancing test. And, you know, it would be your burden as the defense attorney to show, hey, if you took A, you know, with him on the ride with B, you know, for B string of robberies, that it would be so unfair to A uh, that he should be split off and tried separately. Uh, but as a prima facie uh, issue of joinder, it is properly joined. So those are some of the issues uh, that, that you know, can come up with, with Joinder. Um, it gets a lot more complicated than that, believe it or not. Um, but uh, that's just kind of a, sort of a basic sort of introduction to it uh, as it relates to sort of criminal law. So make sure, at the very least, that your client uh, you know, is properly joined, that you know, he's <coughs> named in the offenses and shouldn't be named up. Otherwise, 
you're going to want to uh, file a motion to severance. That's a good idea. Um, however, <coughs> even before that, uh, you want to do <laughs> what's, what, uh, what's known as a demure. Um, and a demure is essentially, it's basically, for our purposes, similar to a severance motion. It's just done uh, before your client enters a plea, and it's basically an attack on the, you know, saying that the pleading on its face is insufficient. Um, there's some case law out there that says that um, you should move for demure before a plea is entered as opposed to waiting later and then moving for severance later in the game. So it's something you want to try to take care of early if you recognize the issue. Does anyone have any questions at this point? No questions. All right. Um, if there's no further questions, then oh. yes. You have an informal discovery request. I do have an informal discovery request. So when should a attorney decide to send that to the district attorney? That's a very good question. Let's talk about that. Um, so if you go to the back of the packet, um, about three pages in. Um, you're going to see some letterhead with my name in really big letters. It's also got my name and phone number and email address on it because I, was, I didn't bring my business cards, so keep this. Um, and you're gonna see, that's, that's called an informal discovery request. Well, why is that in the packet? Well, typically speaking, um, when you get a call from conflicts, and they say, hey, we got a case for you tomorrow. We want you to go up here and, and handle this case. I, for the most part, will recommend that you try to prepare one of these ahead of time. Um, the reason is because until you request uh, discovery from the DA, the DA really has no burden to give it to you. There's some discovery they have to give you no matter what. It's called Brady, and that means anything that is uh, exculpatory to your client, they have to make you aware of. But if you want to get copies of photos, audio tapes, videotapes, you have to ask the the district attorney for. And uh, this is a letter uh, that I've used to, to, to ask for, for things from the district attorney. Um, I've seen some attorneys with form letters, like out the CEB forms manual, that are like seven pages long and pretty much, uh, I guess, throw in every case that's ever been decided, any every discovery case and every statute that ever references discovery. I've tended to find that that's unnecessary. Um, for me, you know, I track the language of the statute, uh, which is uh, Penal Code uh, 1054.1. Um, I do make a, a brief reference to Brady, but, the, that's, but that's an obligation they have regardless. And then what's really helpful um, is if you put any specific items that you have in mind. And the reason that that's really helpful is because um, at least this DA's office does what's called horizontal prosecution on the misdemeanor level. Uh, and that means that the DA you see one day is not going to be the DA you see the next day. Um, you know, when I was at the DA's office, uh, I would get 30 to 50 files, uh, and I, from 4 till 7 the night before, take about 5 to 10 minutes to look at each of them. And then on the next morning, I uh, bring them all to court at 8.30, and I've forgotten about 80% of what I read the night before. And, uh, yeah, and, that, and it would be really hard. So... Can I add another note? I also yeah. practice criminal law. And, you know, to keep in mind when you submit an informal discovery request, the DA is supposed to submit your discovery either tell, to tell you that you, they have it and it's available or that they don't have it, it's unavailable for whatever reason. And you have 15, they have 15 days to respond in that way. So if you, if they don't, if you don't get a response or they don't deliver it to you within 15 days, you can then file a motion to compel, and it then becomes a matter in front of the judge, and the judge will decide whether, yes, this was um, there, the discovery was there, it was available, and the district attorney failed to provide it to you, then they can issue an order to have the discovery turned over to you. And if they fail to do that at that point, then it be can become a sanction uh, order. So just to keep those things in mind. Um, there, are there any other questions regarding this? 
everything else we got for here. Yeah, you know, and, and, and what I'll usually do is I'll take a look through a file and I'll see if there's any uh, evidence mentioned specifically in the police report. If I see it specifically enumerated, I'll specifically enumerate it. So then the DA sees my paper, they know exactly what to request, they don't have to go through, you know, a hundred page file, they just have it, they can just copy it, put it on a request to the police, and usually you'll get discovery a little bit quicker uh, that way. And sometimes it won't be in the face of, of, a dis of your discovery packet either. You know, there are things such as um, like taser incidents, there are going to be, you know, memory download chips in the taser itself, and you won't necessarily know that's something discoverable or that's available, or reports that were made within the police department, you know, because there was a reported violation or um, personnel records or things like that. So. That will be um, addressed in our further, our, our other series um, classes, but these are all things to take into consideration when you begin a case. I'm going I'm to mention two more yeah. things and I'm done. Okay, um, take your time. <laughs> on the complaint, one of the defendants is charged with prior convictions and a probation violation. I'm not going to say a whole lot about um, priors because they can get really complicated. Here's the only thing I'll say. Uh, for purposes of this session is order the priors. And when I say order the priors, what I mean is um, write a letter to the courts that are alleged that these priors are alleged to have happened in and ask them to send you a copy of the convictions um, and make sure that they exist. Because DAs usually rely on rap sheets when alleging the prior convictions yeah. and rap sheets are sometimes wrong. And they're particularly wrong where someone may have gotten a conviction and then got it expunged, or where uh, something weird happened, like a you know motion you know a motion to suppress was granted. Um, there are some, there are odd reasons why sometimes rap sheets have mistakes on them, but just make sure that if your client is going to go down for a prior conviction, that they have it. So so order those. You can write a letter to the court, let them know that you're appointed counsel and that your client's indigent, and they'll send it to you for free. Um, aside from that, I have nothing else unless you have questions for me. All right. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm going to sit oh, down and watch the civil part. Actually, uh, Jeff Thayer was supposed to do this portion of the presentation. However, he is um, on a deposition in somewhere, I don't know, an hour past Lake Tahoe. So he's here on my phone. He's listening to everyone now. <laughs> Say hi to Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself really quickly so you know, so everyone can understand that where this um, presentation came from? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I've been doing civil litigation for uh, about 14 years now. Um, I've done both plaintiff and defense side work, and currently do mostly defense side work. But I have enough plaintiff's work.
I was able to jump in a little bit there. So I appreciate Dorian letting me jump in on this presentation a little bit. Okay, so let me start off here. This presentation is going to focus on California state law and not so much on federal law, on federal lit litigation, okay? Just to put that out there. So, you know, there are things when you are a plaintiff and you want to file a lawsuit. There are things that you need to think about before you file your lawsuit. First and foremost, obviously, is interview your client. You know, get the documents that you need from your client and listen to their story. Listen to what causes of action you may have um, for your client. The client's not going to necessarily know. They may have some sort of idea like this is a medical malpractice or this is a real estate dispute, but there might be other things that you have, you as the attorney have to know and research and, and understand what's going on. So get, in, um, get medical records if necessary. Have your client sign an authorization to release uh, their medical records to you. You know, get these kind of documents um, beforehand if possible. Before the inter you know, before the interview, or or there shortly thereafter, um, those are important things to do. Okay, um, the other thing too is you need to do the research um, to prove what your causes of actions are. For example, in the criminal, we had the Calcrims. Those laid out all of the elements that you need to prove um, if you are a district attorney in order to convict someone of a crime. And similarly, in California, we have something called um, Bagi and Casey. So I'll write this down here. So we have Bagi, B-A-J-I, and then we also have Casey. So Casey is usually what is used in the state of California. And Bagi stands for a Book of Approved Jury Instructions. And KC stands for California Civil Jury Instructions. Um, I did not include in your packet the KCs, but they're available online. And this is this is an example of one. It looks very similar to the criminal CalCrim one. For example, this one is negligence, essential factual elements. It says name of plaintiff claims that he or she was harmed by name of defendant's negligence. To establish this claim, name of plaintiff must prove all of the following. Number one, that name of defendant was negligent. That name of plaintiff was harmed. And that name of defendant's negligence was a substantial factor in causing plaintiff's harm. So these are the elements that must be proved for negligence. And similar to the criminal portion, they have directions for the use. In medical malpractice or professional negligence cases, the word medical or professional should be added before the word negligence. So these are different things that are instructive to how the jury will, you know, will understand and, and the elements and the things that you're going to need to prove. And similar, similarly, there are sources and authorities that are on here. And this is a great source of um, research materials, case law, things that can def further define what you to prove. And yes? Is pretty much every cause of action found within the jury instructions? Um, or is it like just the most common ones? Or? Jeff, do you want to answer this one? The question was, are most every cause of action found in KC or Bagi? Uh, yeah, I mean, the major ones anyways. Um, the major yeah, ones were there, yeah. And the other thing too is, you know, just like everything else, you can always change it around. Like Dorian said, this, this is not the law. So, and, and ex for an example, it says directions for use, insert the word medical or professional. So you can similarly do the same thing if you need to, if it applies to your case, you know. So keep, keep those things in mind. Um, also on the criminal side, that's also available to you too, to change the jury instructions if necessary, or add instructions that you know, the element, it might be theft, but it, there might be some defense, like a business and professions code, for example, could be there as a defense. So you want to add that in, and, you know, these are things that you're not going to be 
realizing until you start working in it, but these are things you should keep in mind. This is how you kind of um, make the most out of your case, let's say. Okay, so next, um, you have to think about punitive damages. So, can anyone tell me what you need to allege for punitive damages? That's very good. That's exactly right. So to seek punitive damages, you need to allege malice, oppression, and or fraud. This is very important. So you need to look at the jury instructions for the elements of these necessary requirements to seek punitive damages. Um, let's see. We'll, we'll discuss punitive damages a little further below. Yes, Ryan? What the special damages mean are uh, general damages. Maybe you'd like to answer your So general damages where special damages are like hard damages. For example, I spent you know five thousand dollars on my doctor. I have ten thousand dollar wage loss claim. My special damages are fifteen thousand. So is punitive like fully separate from both of those? I'm sorry. Are punitive separate from both of those? Yes, yes, that's right. Very good, very good questions. Okay, so the other thing too is who do you have to sue? So there's an issue of joinder here. And there's mandatory joinder, and there's optional or permissive joinder. And you can look at CCP 389A. Oops, that's a P. Okay, now be aware of how joinder will affect your venue. There may be tactical considerations. Um, as to whether to add a party or not to add a party. Is this person or company or corporation going to help your case or hurt your case when adding, adding them? And you have to understand some of them, as we mentioned, are mandatory and some are permissive. So if they're mandatory, you don't really have a choice whether you, you have to join them or not. They have to be joined. But if it is permissive, you should look and see whether it is favorable to your case to join them or not. Um, let's see. Um, you might want to think about the potential damages that could come in by joining a defendant. Um, so, you know, these are things to think about. So, let's see. So, in personal injury and property damage or wrongful death cases, you have to be aware of Prop 51. That's Civ Code Section 1431. And this allows defendants to limit their liability for non-economic damages, like pain and suffering and emotional distress. By proving others were at least partly to blame for the alleged injury or damage. To get all of these damages, you'll want to add anyone who may potentially have been at fault. Yes, Martha. What was the case, personal injury and? It's uh, prop. But what for the case types? Oh, um, <coughs> it is for personal injury, property damage, or, or wrongful death cases. Okay. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is a very important thing, is the statute of limitations. <coughs> when is the end of the statute of limitations? You know, like uh, we had um, in the criminal cases, it depends on whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. This, you know, it, you need to figure this out. And one of the ways you can do that is by looking at the Rudder Group Guide or the California Civil Code. <coughs> so the California Civil Code um, has it, and also CCP uh, 412 to 439.4, they also have the common um, or all of the statute of limitations for California. So some common statute of limitations are, does anyone know for personal injury? Two years. Two years, two years that's right. Okay, what about a breach of a written contract? Four. 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 Yeah, okay. So these are these are some people you should call if you have a case. They, I'm just kidding. Yes? Um, here's a point. Point if you were, you decide what the complaint is going to be, so you can decide whether it's going to be um, uh, contract or tort. But can you say that, can you take a contract, if it, if it happened at three years ago, 
you take, you say, this is the contract that caused the torque, and join the torque in, and drag the torque into the contract uh, for statute of limitations. I I don't think you can do that, but let's ask Jeff here. Jeff, the question was, if you have a breach of a contract, but it resulted in a tort also, is that what your mm -hmm. question is? Can you have four years for the breach of contract and the tort is two years, can you use the breach of contract to drag in the tort? Uh, well, they're basically using the claims. They're two separate statutes, so um, you know, you have to look at them but um, in practice, Yeah, I would agree looking that up separately and, you know, the, I think it's at the judge's discretion too. So the judge might say at the end of the day, you know, that you're trying to just pull this in and this is probably not fair. So um, I would do more research on that as well. Okay. Um, also look at where you can sue the venue. You know, what state, what county, what's going to be favorable to you. I know Jeffrey does um, some asbestos cases and he... They've always sued in like San Francisco County, Alameda County. You know, they rarely sue in unfavorable counties for them. And these are places where the jury is going to be a little bit more um, liberal and they'll probably award more damages. So that's why these plaintiffs sue in certain, certain counties. So um, also think about whether you have a federal case or a state case and which one is more favorable. Is the federal rules going to be more favorable or the state rules going to be more favorable? Generally, I think it, the state rules are probably going to be more favorable. The county where you most practice is probably going to be more favorable for you. The judges are probably going to know you more and going to um, be able to work with you more. I'm not saying that they're going to you know, award the case to you, but it, you might be more comfortable. Just some things to keep in mind. Um, you might also want to think about um, other states' laws that may apply. You know, maybe Tennessee law applies in this situation. Maybe um, another state is more favorable to you. So you can also sue in this, in this, um, in our state, in this county, and then bring in a Tennessee law if if it has a nexus or a relation to it. So these are some things to think about as well. Um, let's see. Okay, and then you also have to look at the causes of action and see if there are some that require you to make notice or demand to the defendant first. So examples are breach of warranty where goods are received and certain defamation actions where you're demanding a retraction. You have to give notice to the defendant so that um, they are put on notice of these causes of action. Okay, now let's go here. As a plaintiff, you decide to file a lawsuit. So let's look at this complaint that we have in your, in your packet. So you may be able to use a judicial counsel form. These are forms that are found online. And depending on the nature of your case, you know, you, you, if it's very simple, minor case, you may want to use the forms. But you know, we suggest that you use a non-generic pleading and really flesh out your own complaint. So here is an example of a very generic complaint. This one is for common law unfair competition. So let's see, you know, it has general pleading form here in front. And then we'll look here and it has the parties that are included. So it will say plaintiff is a corporation organized and existing under the laws of the state of California, et cetera, et cetera. Defendant is and at all material times was a corporation organized existing, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is basically the form of every pleading, of every complaint. And so we've included this as a sample for you. So are there any questions so far? Yes, Dorian. So when I was in law school, I, in Civ Pro, I learned about notice pleading. And like they showed me like, I guess a minimally sufficient complaint, where it's pretty much like, plaintiff is here, defendant is here, 
plaintiff crashed into the defendant negligently and give me lots of money, and that was pretty much it. And I was like, that's efficient under federal law. But I heard that California is like back pleading. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, do you want to answer that? No, California does follow the notice pleading standards and, you know, not to uh, contradict you, Natasha, but I see lots of good firms and good attorneys using judicial counsel form complaint because they actually don't want to fill you in on the facts. They want to kind of keep you in the dark as long as possible. Because, you know, they, they have a choice of what to file. The accident happened two years ago. They know all about it. You're, you're the defendant. You're just learning about it. Right. Yeah, that's true. It could be strategic to your favor, too. And, you know, if you use a form, you know if you're you're doing it pretty much right. If you check off the boxes and fill in, you know, the, the facts and, and the com complaint, what you need to do, it's, you know, it's it's easy, too. If you, if you get too strategic and you try to be too, too minimalist, then, you know, of course, your complaint's subject to a demur. Or right. So you fail to state sufficient facts. So you, so you said that California is notice pleading? Correct. Okay. Oh, so I heard wrong. Okay. Okay, let me see here. Um, oh, also, you should check out the local rules of the county that you're in um, to see if they have uh, separately stated um, requirements that they'd like you to follow. So that's always another good tip to have. Um, and just remember, each cause of action must be separately stated and separately numbered. Uh, state the parties asserting it and the parties it is asserted against, and that is the CRC 2.112. Um, so right here it says, first cause of action, co common law, unfair competition. And um, it says plaintiff, plaintiff is a business here. And it goes through each one what it is alleging the cause of action so you should follow that. Let's see here. Let's see. Okay, the, another thing to think about is you may not know all of the defendants that are involved in your lawsuit yet. You may have an idea of one or two, but you think there might be other defendants out there. So if that is the case, then you'll want to name the DOE defendants, D-O-E, and um, you can put that here. So when you put it, you can say, um, you know, uh, Joe's Mechanic Company, uh, blah, blah, blah. And then it says the California Corporation and Joe's 1 through to 50 inclusive. So that is a way to include these defendants that you are, may not be aware of that are out there. Okay, so for each cause of action, you have to state the facts constituting the state of action in ordinary and concise language. Again, you can go to the jury instructions to help you with that, and they will tell you each of the elements of the, of the um, cause of action that you need to prove and recover at trial. So um, that will, we have an example here, so you can go over that and look at that. Okay, let's see. Is there anything else you want to include, Jeff? Um, no. Uh, it, it, the gist of it is, is to plead, uh, plead the ultimate facts that fit each of the elements of your cause of action in simple, concise language. Minus the ultimate facts. Um, you don't have to put every single fact you have in just the facts that go to the gist of each element of the cause of action. Um, the point is that the defendant has to be on notice of what they're being sued for and why. What, what are the, the ultimate facts that uh, support that lawsuit? Okay, thanks. So if you're asserting a claim for punitive damages, you should look at the jury instructions. And again, we've said that you have to prove malice, oppression, or fraud. So you should put that in your complaint with sufficient facts to support them as well. Um, if you're alleging a breach of contract, you should either quote the, the language word for word or you can attach it to your complaint um, in total and for the judge to review as well. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Some claims require more detailed pleading, for example, allegations of fraud, because they consist of a serious attack on character. They must be pleaded with particularity. So I have a case here. It's called the Committee on Children's Television, um, Inc. versus General Foods Corp, 1983. The site is 35 um, Cal 3rd, 197, page 216. So you can look at the elements of fraud stated in the jury instructions, and you can be as detailed as you can be regarding each element. So um, another claim that requires detailed pleading is conspiracy. It's I think we have that in our packet as well. Is that tr is that right, Jeff? You put a, put this in there. Uh, yeah, that's in your but we just made copies of it. It was just too long. Okay. Uh, but if somebody if somebody wants to take a look at it. Okay. Yeah, if you want to take a look, this is um, different causes of action for conspiracy. If you guys want to start. Of the demur. 
uh, thereafter, the plaintiff can amend uh, by seeking leave of court via a notice motion or ex parte application if adding or deleting or changing the names of parties. Yes? Where the defendant files a timely answer but fails to serve the answer on the plaintiff or plaintiff's counsel, mm -hmm. uh, what's the remedy for the plaintiff? Um, the plaintiff, so the defendant filed a timely answer but failed to serve it right. on the plaintiff. Right. Um, well, the plaintiff can then go to court and say that I wasn't properly served, right. but the judge would probably extend the time to have it served to you. So there's basically yeah. no teeth to the rule that you've been Well, I mean, it on. depends on the service. Like, was it unintentionally served, not served to the plaintiff, you know, or was it intentional that they just didn't want to do that so that they would have more time? You know, I mean, it depends on a whole array of things. Yeah. Okay, so now as a defendant, um, once you receive a complaint and before you file your answer, you want to take a look at different things. So first of all, did the plaintiff sue in the right court? You know, can you remove this to federal court? And if so, what are the advantages to doing that? Some things are supposed to be filed in federal court. For example, patent litigation, it has to be filed in, in federal court. So if it's filed in state court, it's not it's not right, you know, and so you can have it removed. Um, generally, as a defendant, you would, could be better off in federal court for the same reasons why it's generally better for a plaintiff to be in state court. So these are some things that you have to take into consideration um, as a defendant. Um, let's see. Also, you want to know if you can stay or remove the case based on a forum non-convenience. Is it more convenient? For you to file um, for this case to be in a different county or a different state, even are all the defendants located in a certain county? Was all the harm mostly in one county? You know, so you have to take that into consideration too. Okay, so removal also requires either diversity of citizenship or a federal question. And motion the did the defendant just sue in the wrong court? So is there another venue that would be more convenient for the witnesses as well? Um, also, should you bring other parties into your action? So let's say you have a real estate issue and you are suing the former owners of the home, but maybe for some construction defect, but maybe as the defendant of this case, you may want to bring in the contractor who worked on the house and you may want to bring in um, you know, the, the property inspector who may be liable for not finding this defect in the first place. So these are some things to think about that can help you as a defendant. So it can either shift the blame, right, or you can either split the, the amount to be settled or the damages. So that's some stuff to think about. Okay, so as a defendant, you've decided to answer and you can an you have to answer within 30 days unless there's an ex extension of time per stipulation. So let's say you're a defendant and you've got this complaint and you know you can't you can't answer within 30 days. So you can always call the other attorney, the plaintiff's attorney, and ask, hey, can we extend this to two weeks? Can we, you know, or whatever time is sufficient, and they can stipulate to that, and that will give you more time to answer. So, um, in most cases, the complaint will be unverified as a general, a general denial, which is a blanket denial of the entire complaint, is sufficient to respond to an unverified complaint. So, you could be more specific in your denials, but generally that's unwise. You don't want to tie yourself down to more specific language uh, that may become controverted as discovery progresses. So, let's see here. Um, this is different in federal court. If the complaint is verified, a general denial won't suffice, um, except in limited civil cases. These, you have to be specific as to what you are denying or what you are admitting. And the easiest and best way to do this is to deny specific parts and indicate you are admitting all other material allegations. Uh, for example, defendant denies each allegation of the following numbered paragraphs, or defendant denies the following allegations, admits all other allegations. So you can also deny based on information or belief, or deny based on lack of information or belief. 
Um, after your denials, you can list your affirmative defenses. Look at the jury instructions and plead them as if you were pleading them in a complaint. Um, so here we have an example of an answer to complaint for damages. It's in your packet. So here you can see it says first affirmative defense. The complaint and each and every cause of action alleged therein fails to state facts sufficient to constitute a cause of action against defendant and fails to state a claim upon which relief may be granted. What does it mean to allege or deny something based on information and or belief? Okay. Jeff, so we have a question. Um, what does it mean to allege or deny um, something, something quote, on information or quote, belief? Quote, on information or belief. In the answer. Or, I don't know. Uh, well, so when, when you say sometimes whether it's first-hand knowledge? Um, is, is that what it turns on, really? Does it turn on first-hand knowledge, Chip? Because, you know, it's kind of 
what your client said, the discovery is going to either bear that out or not. So it might bear it out, but it might not. But it's kind of known that it could shake out either way. Right. When you put that, those magic words. Right. The, the one place, this is jumping ahead, but one place where you want to be careful about on information and belief, if you put that in a declaration, worthless. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Right. And also, it's not going to it's not going to help you on summary judgment if your fact is on information and belief. Defendant did this to a bunch of other people. That's worthless. Thank you. Okay. So let's see. Um, Okay, so I'm going to talk about now different ways to respond. One of another way to respond is um, you can cross complain. Yes. Okay, so I'm just going to go quickly through this. So you can cross complain for affirmative relief. Um, this is CCP 426.30. Otherwise, you can't make the claim in a later lawsuit. Um, this is compulsory. So if your cause of action is related to the subject matter of the complaint, then you can cross-complaint. Uh, the other way is a demur. So this is an objection that an op opponent's point is irrelevant or invalid um, while granting the factual basis on that point. So this gives the defendant a chance to narrow the issues through the pleadings, uh, which can give you a better chance to plot a defense and make a dispositive motion later on. Uh, keep in mind that the plaintiff can always amend the complaint to cure any defects as well. So let's see. Uh, let me move on a little bit here. So let me give this to you. We don't have time to cover it right now, but these are the grounds for demur to complaint, and that you can find those at the CCP 430.80A. So except for failure, these are waived. Unless, um, except for failure to state facts sufficient to constitute cause of action and subject matter jurisdiction. So if you don't raise these, then you are essentially waiving them as well. So that's something very important to think about. Um, and the procedure is the same as a motion. And I think we have here, we've attached a demur, sample demur in here for you guys as well. So you can take a look at that later. Um, Okay, next we have a motion to strike. So another way you can do it is motion to strike. Yes. So let's go there is so you continue using the murder of civil and probably six and criminal? No, probably six federal. Jeff's card there too.